Okay, thank you and welcome everybody to this evening's uh, meeting of City of York Council's Audit and Governance Committee. Uh, my name is Councillor Hollier, I'll be chairing the committee this evening. I'm joined variously by um, council officers and members of the committee on either side. So I'll just ask if um, officers could perhaps introduce themselves, name and title when they first speak, that would be helpful and obviously external uh, people as well, thank you. Um, have we got any declarations of interest? No. Oh, okay. But a few apologies. So we've got apologies from um, Mr. Lee and uh, Mr. Binney, and we've got apologies from um, Councillor Burton, who's been substituted by Councillor Burton. Uh, no relation. Um, obviously, Councillor Burton uh, was the vice chair, so um, I'm hoping we're all happy to elect Councillor Rose as vice chair for the meeting. Yeah, I think mm -hmm. everybody's happy with that. Just in case I drop dead um see how it goes um we move on then to item two which is exclusion of press and public so you'll you'll know we've got various appendices um related to some uh audit reports um and it's recommended to uh go into private session to discuss those I assume we're all happy to do so yeah okay We'll move that item to the very end of the agenda. So we'll just um, close the meeting uh, at the point we get to that, but we'll take the work plan and any urgent business um, just immediately prior to that. That's okay. Move on then to minutes and the action log of the last meeting. Uh, firstly, any comments on the minutes? Uh, Councillor Mason. Obviously, I'd made some observations about the kind of lack of notice of having that extra meeting. Um, and obviously in August as well, when it's already kind of stretched and holiday time, but it doesn't appear in the meeting in the meeting minutes. So I just wondered if that could be added somewhere under the work plan. Okay, we're happy to add that in. I think if um, we just check the recording and add some suitable words in there. Um, Councillor Merrin? Yeah, um, can I just raise on uh, minute four? Excuse me, Chair. Could everybody speak up, please? Yeah. Can I uh, raise uh, minute four, where we were discussing the corporate risks? Um, and I raised concerns about the absence of uh, governance member uh, member aspects. Now it's minuted that it, the feedback from members should be taken into account in future. That wasn't the point that was being made, and I must I haven't gone back over the uh, the um, webcast. I thought we'd agreed that that should actually be an extra corporate uh, risk. Okay. Um, I think perhaps if we defer agreeing the minutes for this meeting until the next meeting, and perhaps if we could agree some formal words that sort of corrects that sort of issue, that would be okay. Yeah. Any other issues to raise? No. Um, we'll have a look then at the action log. There's a number of um, items which are obviously past due um, and a number which uh are being sort of met this evening um i don't know if anybody has any specific questions on or sort of would like to raise any issues on any of the ones uh Councilor rose um yes i think um I'll, I'll whittle down my list of things that i think are on the outstanding that are completed now so i think action eight is covered by item eight of the agenda um action 14 has been completed by the constitution working group uh, action 42 and Action 46 are both completed in advance of this meeting. Um, action 49 is covered by item 8 of this meeting. Um, action 55, I think, has been answered about 10 minutes ago with the agenda for next week, um, because that contains the um, tracked and untracked constitution um, uh, points. And then Action 59 says that it's due to come this evening. I can't see it in any of the agenda papers, 
but I wondered whether that's because I'm misunderstanding what it's called or something like that. So if if we could get an update on Action 59, I think the other six I've mentioned are all complete and can be taken from that list. But Okay. Um, yeah, I don't know if, if you could... Yeah, so action action fifty nine was in relation to the um the fact that some recommendations were were occurring were reoccurring every year in the annual auditors report and and so we'll resolve that when we get this year's annual auditors report which will be um November potentially so um as we go through this year's audit we'll pick up and make sure with Mazars that those actions have been completed and um also speak with Mazars about I think it's about including a timeline as to when the actions would be completed that, that so was we'll it. the, the that action with, for with this, this meeting was the timeline of if it is between now and November what that looks like in practice yeah. um I can't see the timeline in here no and there isn't a it isn't being resolved on today's meeting so no, it, it should either be November or it should, it should have a timeline yeah. or whatever that is that was my it's, it's it is still outstanding we, we can look at a timeline but it'll be superseded by Mazars doing their audit so, yeah. so it would sort of it's better if we could wait until November if members are, are happy with that um and we'll pick it up in the 23 24 annual auditors report yeah i mean I'm, I'm i'm as long as it's accurate i'm happy either way whether it is i think a timeline is useful for us to know it's what's happening between now and november um but that doesn't have to be an action i don't think that would be an informal thing to take offline i think it'd be better to clarify what the actual thing we want done by november is and have a november date on it personally but happy to be follow you know follow the committee's thoughts okay yeah any further comments on the action plan Okay, so I think then if we defer signing the meeting, uh, the meeting minutes of the last meeting until the next meeting, um, just to correct those couple of issues, um, it's only a week or so to wait. We move on then to item four, which is public participation. Um, our first speaker is um, Flick Williams, um, who I'm hoping is uh, available remotely. I don't, can you hear us, Flick? Yes, good evening. Good evening. Um, yep, you'll know you've got three minutes to address the committee and if you'd like to make a, a start in your own time. I have some questions and serious concerns regarding the recently published decision notice regarding the station gateway project. I have issues with the decision itself, but that is properly left for another day in another place. Now, today I shall raise my concerns about issues of governance regarding this decision. The decision notice was published on Friday the 26th of July and yet it states the decision was actually made a month earlier on the 28th of June. I do not see how that can be the case given that on Wednesday last week views were being canvassed of the chair of the access forum regarding a last minute and significant change as to what had previously been agreed and that change appears in the decision notice. The decision also states that the access forum was consulted on 22nd of November 2024, so we're all time travellers now. This is just sloppy and frankly, given the enormity of the problems with this scheme, may well be subject to subsequent legal challenge. This authority, like many others, relies on citizens not having the funds to seek a judicial review under the public sector equality duty. But don't count on it. It only takes one disabled person living in a care home without any assets to change that. But this is listed as a key decision. So why has it not gone to a scrutiny committee or an executive member decision session and therefore cannot be subject to call in? I would hope that you members are as concerned as I am that this decision was made by the Chief Operating Officer. And as to the detail, I would have erased that at EPAT scrutiny this week with its remit covering both place and transport, only to find scrutiny meetings this week are cancelled. The chair of EPAT scrutiny is on parental leave, but is that not why committees have deputy chairs? This after such a lengthy period of two pre-election periods in succession for both the mayoral and general elections, meaning an, in, an inordinate amount of regular business has been delayed or decisions made by officers instead of elected members. We regularly hear at such scrutiny committees about the difficulty fitting everything into work plans, and yet now, owing to the summer period, issues will get pushed into the autumn and beyond. A council that runs on a cabinet rather than a committee system requires robust scrutiny committees for proper oversight of decision making, together with yourselves overseeing audit and governance. 
Back-to-back pre-election periods starting in April followed by an August shutdown has left this council adrift with regard to its decision-making processes and some strange decisions along the way in terms of which meetings to hold and which to cancel. I refer specifically to the Licensing and Regulatory Committee and the Uber application with profoundly political undertones. Poor and unaccountable decision-making will cost us all dearly in the long term. Thank you. Thank you, and um, thank you for your comments this evening. Um, obviously, you've raised a, a number of different questions and issues there. Um, I'm not sure there's anybody sort of capable of answering them that's in the meeting at the moment, unless anybody wants to to shout out. But I will take your questions and issues away and ask the um, sort of relevant officers directly uh, and see see if we can get some answers on those. So thank you. Just, just I, I, I'm looking at the um, publication data, 26th July and 28th, six uh, data decision. Obviously, the CO is not here to answer the question around it. But could we, as an, as a committee, when we get the answer, be copied in on the response? Yeah, that's okay. all right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our next speaker then is um, Gwen Swinburne, who's speaking in person. Thank you, Chair. On an administrative issue, I simply can't hear people. I've got good hearing. I can't hear people. So afterwards, if I can stand over there without people thinking I'm spying on their computers, I would appreciate it. Yeah, I think as well, remember, <laughs> we've got big packs of papers that yes. occasionally block the, um, and similarly with um, laptops and things. So I think we just try and be careful to speak directly into yeah. the into thank the microphone. You. Thank you. I just didn't want people to think I'm... <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Members will now have received copies of the statutory account objection lodged with the external auditors. In view of the seriousness and the many significant, gov significant governance failures, the objection addresses only the annual governance statement, not the core accounts. The AGS is the document that should be relied upon to give us assurance that governance is both lawful and fit for purpose. You know, and we know this is not, that it is not. The repeated pleadings from the statutory officer that all the failings exposed are simply one-off admin errors would be funny if it wasn't so serious. The fact that the officer report stated any serious control issues are included in the draft AGS, whilst the draft neither included the ICO enforcement action, nor the very concerning peer review, nor significant employment tribunal outcomes, reflects the lack of engagement by all the statutory officers in the process, particularly the Director of Governance and Chief Operating Officer. It isn't right that the Section 151 has to put up with being stuck with doing this. Most governance failures lay at the door of others, not in her control. So to the section 151, sorry, you had to have your name on this. May I ask, Chair, whatever the outcome of the accounts inspection uh, objection, that in future the draft AGS from the Director of Governance in conjunction with the section 151 be presented in May Audit and Governance Committee to give you proper time to review and ensure that it is fit for the accounts inspection purposes. May I further ask that the key governance priorities at the end of AGS be completely re-articulated and augmented to something meaningful over the summer. The minimal two, two new finance priorities are meaningless with no plan and there are no new governance priorities at all. Chair, on internal audits, it's very hard to correlate some of the generous audit grades given to ordering and creditor payments, as well as commercial procurement and compliance, when we see the 55% no pay, no purchase order failure and multiple other well-publicized procurement failures. Could RSM undertake a random parallel audit to test the benchmarks Veritel uses? RSM seem to have a far more transparent process and rigorous approach. Finally, Debbie, thank you for all your accounts inspection support and courtesy, as usual. It didn't quite work out this year, but thanks for the effort. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I'm sure we'll raise some of the issues you've um, brought up as we get through the agenda. Thank you. Okay, we can move on then to the, the first substantive item, which is the external audit progress report. Um, and I believe this has been presented by um, Helen Mallon, who's the principal accountant. Thank you, Chair. Yes, this um, provides 
uh, an update from our external auditors, um, Forvis Mazars, get the name right now, um, that Mark um, Outside is here to um, to help take any questions on. I think the um, the report's fairly self-explanatory just to present that report from Mazars. Okay, thank you. So we've just been asked to um, note the issues set out in the report, but if there are any questions or um, issues members would like to raise, um, now would be the time. If not, and we're all happy, then well, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure the other items won't be quite as quick. We will then to item six. Um, which is the draft annual governance um, statement. Um, and I think this has been presented by Debbie. Yep, thank you, Chair. So um, as the public speakers just uh, mentioned, um, uh, the draft annual governance statement is included in the draft account. That is the next item on the agenda. But we thought, given some of the uh, comments made and the objections raised by residents, that it would be helpful to have this as a separate item on the agenda to allow our members to have a full discussion. A couple of points just to make uh, is a draft and um, we can change it uh, you won't um we won't be asking the chief operating officer or the leader to sign this just yet uh, you will see a final version when we present you the final audited statement of accounts which hopefully november we'll, we'll see um so we, we are making some changes um some of the comments um, from residents will be incorporated. So it's really just here for your comments, um, feedback, suggestions, just a, a discussion on really. Okay, thank you. And um, you've mentioned some anticipated changes. Are there any it's worth just highlighting that we're sort of expecting to make or I don't know, Helen, there are some that we're making, aren't we? So we are, um, it was an oversight not to include details of the ICO enforcement notice. Um, yeah, that is that is the main one we've updated on so far. We have a, yeah. a revised draft already in progress and the item relating to the ICO is, is has been included now. And we were, we did have a debate about the LGA, um, LGA uh, peer review uh, Helen and I, as accountants, took quite a purist view that, that um, the report didn't come until the current financial year, but absolutely appreciate and understand comments that the issues uh, raised in the peer review did relate to the previous year. So we, we were taking quite a purist view on it, but totally accept that um, we need to include some references. It's, it's an issue that you've been debating. It's an issue you'll be debating later on this evening. So we'll, we'll include some of those things as well. So uh, we're happy to consider any other areas that you feel have been uh, omitted. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions or comments from the committee? Councillor Mary? Could I ask on uh, one of the points uh, Ms Swinburne raised about who signs the report? Um, are, is that statutorily laid down? Because it did seem quite a reasonable point that obviously there's gov governance issues that don't fall uh, under the director of finance, but under the monitoring officer. Uh, and, you know, th those are obviously absolutely key as well. That, that, that seemed quite a point. In terms of the statement itself, it's prepared by a group of officers, so um, including the Director of Governance, myself, um, uh, our colleagues at Verito um, will contribute information governance, finance, HR, IT, a whole range of officers have an opportunity to contribute to um, flagging any governance issues and formulating the statement. Um, it's Helen and myself. Helen, we've pulled it, finance have pulled it together, but we've sort of just done the admin, really. So it's it's a collective effort. In terms of the final signing of the statement, that is the head of paid service and the leader of the council. So that is who ultimately signs the final governance statement, although clearly they will take on board comments made by this committee and others. Is that correct, Helen? Yeah, I think that's a fair assessment, Debbie. We we present our assessment of the um, governance arrangements within the council um, for sign off by the leader and chief operating officer. But they don't do that until um, the audit period's passed. Okay. 
there any further questions? Um, Councillor Mason and then Councillor Rose. Uh, thanks. The first one was on the um, uh, absence management marking that as complete, and then obviously having figures in there that basically don't show it's significantly changed or got any better. So I just wondered if there's any observations on that or where else it might go in terms of picking it up, because clearly it, it still seems to be a lingering thing. And then under uh, uh, the capital, uh, major capital projects, we still got the guild hall being refer re referenced. So again, I wasn't sure. Is that just because it means the guild hall is in the little bit at the side we're trying to get rid of still, or does it mean the main bit because we still have capital costs? I just didn't quite understand the kind of context when it's referred to as just the guild hall, what that kind of meant. Where, sorry, whereabouts, Councillor, is the major guild. capital projects? Do you have a page number? Sorry. Yeah, uh, sorry, I'm looking at my iPad. It is uh, under the banner existing issues. So, uh, current governance issues. Page 65. 65 thank you. I can do. Do you want to do that? I was just going to say well, we will um, update the reference in terms of the guild hall. That's probably less relevant than it was in terms of major projects, so we can update for that. Um, your other question was about um, absence management, wasn't it? And I think basically we're taking the view that we have put lots of processes in place now around managing absence. Um, we are starting to see improvements. Potentially, the stats don't show such stark improvement, but it's a business as usual process now with the absence management process and the use of medical. So um, that's why we don't feel it's still a significant governance issue. And just to go back then on the guild hall, uh, is that right that we're happy that the guild hall, guild hall part of it's not an issue anymore, but we still got some issues with the other half? It's intended just to be uh, um, an example of the sort of major projects that we're talking about. So we, you know, Guildhall, York Central, York, at one point we've added stage in. We've just omitted to update the example list of major capital programmes to include something perhaps uh, slightly more relevant and up-to-date. And, and in terms of the absent, absence management issue, just to add to what Helen um, has already said, it's in, uh, just wanted to point out that these are about governance issues, not management issues. So... The reason it was raised as a governance issue is we didn't have a system to record absence and that's why it was a governance concern. We do now have a system and you're right, absence hasn't reduced significantly and that is a management concern, which is not something that, does that make sense? Thank you. Okay, um, Councillor Rose. Um, yeah, I've got um, five quick ones. Um, the first one is it mentions um, the it says the number of significant breaches reported to the information commissioner's office has remained the same one in the previous year and one in this year and then it just doesn't talk about the one significant breach that we've had in the last year um, it feels like the ICO enforcement action stuff should be in detail I know that that's been modified I don't know what it, to what extent but um, um, yeah I think if we have one significant breach every year I'd quite like to see it in the details of it every year um, the um, second point is similar which is the LG, the LGA peer review and, and and the plan from it, it doesn't, I don't think, raise anything that in the context of this would be considered a significant um a significant concern, but it was part of the response to previous significant concerns and it has quite a lot of depth in it. I wasn't certain to what extent it was this financial year, but it is in the narrative report of the financial year's account. So I think that we should at least have references to the LGA peer review, even if it's seen as a positive response to previous concerns. Um, and then three of the things that Gwen's raised, that the first one was Section 106 outstanding money and um, the, the size of that. Uh, are there any, I think that might even be the the, the, the budget um, accounts rather than, than the AGS, but um, is that something that we've got any concern about risks attached to it beyond what we've had in previous years? Um, is there something that we should be having in the risk section of the AGS on that? And the other two were project completion report timelines some of them are years overdue um we don't have many of them anyway is that something we should be concerned about should we be expecting more frequent reports from from the major projects um and then the same with the community governance review that on the council's own website it actually says we couldn't do it in 2017 it's definitely happening in 2021 and that's what it currently says today so if you're able to just kind of flurry a response to those that'd be great thank you so um absolutely um uh, I'm assuming that Francis uh, doesn't know what the breach details were for the information. I, I don't. 
we'll come we'll we'll find out about that in terms of the final we can include details of that and the lga peer review um the section 106 balances should write that they have gone up um slightly but not massively um it, it is an issue we are looking at it we're aware that we need to improve how it's monitored how it's looked at um Berito have looked at it for an audit recently, and I think there's one in draft and ongoing now. So we are working with Verita to do some work with us to support us to make an improvement to that system so we get things moving more quickly and we have more visibility on, on that. Um, project completion timelines, I'm less concerned about other than that we do need to prompt people to do the completion reports, which is a bit frustrating, but often whilst a report is substantially complete, there's often one or two minor snagging issues that are outstanding or, or some other issue that's outstanding that means it's, it's not actually complete. Again, we're possibly being a bit pedantic to wait until everything's absolutely finished. And so maybe we could do a pre-closure report, if you like. So we, we, I'll take that away to have a look at. The community governance review, I'm afraid I don't know anything about, so I'll have to take that one away, unless anybody else knows something about that, but I don't know anything about it. That's, yeah, I was going to ask who, who's responsible for ownership of it. I think we'd have to check with Lindsay. That's a question taken offline, then. Do I forget your microphone? You know. Chair, I can say that the Community Governance Review is a project that's with the Head of Democratic Governance and um, it will be discharged through um, her service, which includes a new recruit in the post of um, elections manager. So there is a, a, yeah. a, a programme for that, I think, starting September. Chair, if I could come back to the question of who signs off the annual governance statement. I have been just quickly checking um, the legislation, uh, which Debbie is very familiar with, the accounts and audit regulations, um, regulation six, um, the relevant authority, um, the, the findings of the review to be considered by a committee and approve the annual government statement governance statement um, is by resolution of a committee or, or members of the authority as a, as a whole. So that that's I haven't been involved in the in the group of officers preparing it, albeit that I'm sure that the guidance, the SIPPA guidance on the preparation of the annual governance statement has ensured that all of the relevant officers have been uh, including included in putting that together. But clearly this committee plays a, a key part in the sign off of the annual governance statement. Okay. Um Councillor Mary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can I uh, go back earlier in the paper in terms of principle B on page 47 uh, and subsection one on openness? Um, that covers a, a, a number of process issues. Openness is also a, a attitude, state of mind. Um, and in terms of how residents experience openness, a lot of that will be uh, felt through responses to emails, all all those types of things, or where they get to talk to officers directly. So, can I ask what training is provided uh, to staff who are, are customer facing, um, or resident facing, or stakeholder facing, uh, in terms of you know how we are open, how we are transparent. Uh, uh, and so on. That's my first question. Second is, how do you? How is that monitored? You know, are our responses to uh, the public and where public are dissatisfied that they're actually getting the right answers? I can do some of that. So there is. Um... I don't know the detail of the training provided to customer facing staff. I know that all staff through the councils, um, it's called Milo, but I don't know what it stands for, My Learning. So anyway, we have an online platform for delivery of training and, and all, all staff um, do a sort of a, a high level customer services module, if you like, um, about how we should respond to customers, how we should open, how we should be endeavouring to get the answers to their queries correct and get them first time and, and those kind of things. I'm, I'm pretty sure that customer services staff themselves will have more detailed training than that, but I'm afraid I, I don't know what that is, so I'd have to take that away to find out. And in terms of responses to the public and how they're monitored, um, again, uh, I think we would just monitor complaints rather than uh, responses. 
um, I'm just thinking through our own service within within finance. Um, I, I don't I don't have statistics necessarily about the quality of the responses to residents. So that might be something we need to have a look at what we can do with that. I, I certainly think that section needs strengthening because it misses actually what is a major component of 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 that you know in those areas I've, I've touched on. Um, for, for move, moving on. Uh, sorry, it's one of my earlier notes. In the next section, engaging stakeholders. Um, whilst whilst the dip, while the overall is about comprehensive stakeholder engagement. Uh, section two only refers to institutional stakeholders. How, 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 uh, where is the general public in this? Section three talks about engaging with individual yeah. citizens and service users. Yeah. Um, at the top of page 49. Yes, very but, easy to see, is it, without a heading? I was thinking of it, citizens as stakeholders rather than um in in terms of in, i've read the last section as sort of individual responses i'll i'll leave i'll leave that no, so, yeah. so i'm sorry i'm was that, i was looking a bit vacant <laughs> so i was no, no. struggling to think so that the principle is about openness and comprehensive stakeholder engagement yeah. and so we talk about engaging with individual citizens and service users as part of that comprehensive stakeholder engagement so absolutely residents and citizens are stakeholders. Um, sorry, I don't think I've missed the point of the question, perhaps. Yes, I may not have phrased it very well, sorry. Can I also ask in, in terms of that section, sorry, so many pages in this report, you, you move the arrow a bit and you uh, you jump several pages. Um, on page 48, uh, section two, the third arrow point says, we regularly engage with prof professional leads at the head of communications group, the higher education group, the bus group, and the sustainability leads groups. Are, are these internal groups or are these with external Partners. Okay. external partners so a head of communications group um is is the heads of comms at the council uh health um other partners across the city so it's not just yeah. internal i mean it's it's the first time i've sort of uh, heard mention of them are uh, you know is is that information about who and what they are published anywhere um not that i'm aware of um there are i mean there are lots and lots and lots and lots of groups where we meet with officers mm. and colleagues in different organisations across the city and across the region. So, for example, I meet with other directors of finance. We we meet with other procurement leads. Um, Helen has a meeting with other um, principal accountants in other councils. We meet regularly with health colleagues um, to share information. So there are there are lots and lots of them in some more formal than others. Um, so no, there's not a comprehensive list. No. Okay. Um, right. Uh, if I can go to the uh, there's a table later on in this report. Um, yeah. Um, Con contract uh, contract management. Uh, we've, we're obviously waiting the report back on what happened with the, um, uh, the contract with the um, Salvation Army, but I understand uh, there are at least two other contracts where we've in effect been caught out uh, by uh, not having anticipated them ending. Uh, at the date. So I just wanted to ask about our governance processes, but also about um, making uh, you know, a provision of information to outside parties, 
potentially local businesses and so on that might be interested uh, in contracts that are coming up for renewal, uh, whether we publish clear lists of all the contracts that might be coming up in at the right time uh, for people to uh, understand the opportunities that they might have. Um, I'm not aware of the other contracts that you refer to um, specifically, and we maybe don't need, maybe if you, if you email me af right afterwards, um, I, I can have a look at those. We, we do know that contract management is something we need to improve. That's why it's listed here as an issue. We, we know we need to improve that. Um, and we definitely need to improve it because the procurement legislation changes later this year um, and it, it, contract management is a big part of that change in legislation. So Clara Wilcox, our head of procurement, is doing a lot of work, training officers and working across the council and, and across the region, actually, with um, other procurement, uh, heads of procurement uh, to, to provide that training and, um, and, and do some of that work. We've talked many times at this committee actually about contract management. Although I, I don't know that anybody's left from those days, but uh, just to manage expectations, we can improve at contract management, but we don't have a system. Um, we don't have a contract management system, and without an IT system, it's always very difficult to to do some of that work because it relies on spreadsheets, it relies on individuals. So um, we can make improvements, but just to manage expectations about how much we can improve without um, additional investment. Uh, I suppose is the point I would make. In terms of uh, tendering opportunities, contract opportunities, again, uh, in, in common with all the other councils in Yorkshire and Humber, we're part of a Your Tender system where uh, there's a link to it on our website. You don't need to register to see the contracts. I think you do need to register to see the opportunities, but um, tendering opportunities are, are listed there and are shared on that website as well as a contract register. Um, so yeah, I think that's that's reasonably uh, okay. Um, thank you. Just on that, those two issues four and five, it's sort of listed as new issue, but there's there's nothing in sort of action taken or progress made. Does that come be between now and the final version, well, or is um, it something that's an that comes that we're going to do year? during this financial year? So it will be um, next year. Yeah, but we'll we can um, we will obviously won't have made any progress during twenty three twenty four because we've just identified it as an issue. Um, but we can probably have a look at actions, Helen, actually can't wait for the final one and outline a bit more what, what we're looking at doing, what some of the issues are. And, and sorry, scru uh, corporate scrutiny have looked at procurement and contract management as well, so we can just link in with that as well. Um, Councillor Whitcroft. It's on another matter, so Councillor Fisher has a supplementary on the same point. It, it is about the same point. It's me playing the same old record I play every single time that there's no mention whatsoever in engaging with stakeholders, no mention of parish or town councils. And I think since we do consult town councils on planning applications and there is feedback from them, I think it's critically important we include that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Chair. So this, um, just a, a wider question around sort of the role that we as councillors might be able to play within this overall governance. The, a lot of the governance strategy is obviously mainly focused around towards officers. To me, it feels like the the, the governance in place for councillors were almost, there, there isn't a great deal of it, I suppose. We are meant to be at the very top of the governance structure, but whether there could be perhaps more of a role for, particularly when we talk about the principles that are enshrined in what we expect of, the behaviours of people that uh, are that work for the council also, I think, should apply to councillors. Things around the Nolan principles as well, I think, would be welcome within this governance um, strategy. Just because I think we as councillors ought to ought to be held to 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 the same standard as well. Okay. Any further questions? No. Okay. If not, I think we're just. Um, making comments, noting progress to date, and we'll await a final version later in the year. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we can move on then to item seven, which is the draft statement of accounts. And I think we'll back to Helen Manor. Thank you. Yes, so I've just done some training actually about um, statement of accounts. So I um, hope I've not stolen the thunder of the item, but um, this is presenting the Draft Statement of Accounts for 23-24, that's our latest set of accounts, um, which were published on the 7th of June. Um, what followed was a public inspection period of 30 days. Um, 
there was obviously a, a lot of work that's gone into producing these accounts and it isn't just me as a team behind me whose um, support I'm really grateful for. The report really just asks you to note um, the accounts and the possibility of any review questions. And at Annex A, there's a brief um, explanation of each of the core statements. And then at Annex B is the full statement of accounts. So yeah, I'm happy to take any questions um, ahead of the accounts being reviewed by our external auditors. Okay, thank you. Um, obviously it's a, a large report, so to try and avoid starting backwards and forwards if we sort of work our way through um if we could start then if anybody's got any issues or questions on the narrative report um councillor rose i've also got some overarching separate points eg time frames is that better now or at the end or let's go now the, uh, picking up the time, I guess the bundle of timeline questions. Um, obviously, we, we had our, our, our pre-meet training and various bits and pieces. There was reference around COVID timelines, November this year, etc., and what normal peacetime used to look like. And I just wanted to get clarity on this year. It's you know the draft is current, and then the the, the November is the public. Is that the same next financial year? Um, and just a couple of comments and other bits is training for us today makes it harder for us to bring stuff to this meeting. So if next year it could be the meeting before uh, we're receiving it, um, um, it, it just means that there's more in my head already, having reminded myself what we did last year. Um, and the 30 days around level of publicity, you know, I think we, we've, we've already covered that it. it was published, it met all the things we have to, and, and um, I don't think there's anything more that we have to do. Um, I think maybe the, the press uh, would... Uh, if they were doing um, a full full journalism, might the day it's released want to do some digging and have a look at headlines in there because there's probably some in there they'd like um, and could publicise it for us. But um, the the kind of timeline of it sort of came out. We didn't necessarily see it until it was raised or we spotted it in the agenda papers for this. Um, training was quite late. The timeline might be through to November. I'm not sure what's happening next year. All that sort of stuff. I just wanted to highlight as one issue really. Um, but if you can answer about next year, that'd be great. And all noted. Um, I think to take your point about the training, we can continue to do training during the year as well. Um, we could do another session ahead of the final accounts coming to this committee, um, if that would be useful. Um, something else to note on that, but take it all away. Yeah, thank you. The, the specific one around sort of final accounts next year, is that expected uh, to be brought forward or is it still supposed to be November next year like what's the thinking at the moment that's a good point because we had some communication yesterday from MHCLG um we were expecting the um the deadline so the deadline reverted back to the 31st of May for the 23 24 accounts and we were expecting a similar date um for next year but um the back stop dates that have been um, discussed by MHCLG mean that they are putting back publication date for draft accounts to the 30th of June for the next five years. And there will be also a delayed um, final audit date for um, as a result. So the timetable time is shifting for the next five years in order to accommodate the audit backlog. Okay, do you want to move on to your narrative? Yeah, I've got, I mean, I've got infinite points, I'm afraid everybody. Um, the, main, the main point in narrative, I guess, is I mean, context of the of the report, you know, we've had a BBC article this week about how we're about set just under seven hundred pounds per person short of average funding in the country, which is about one hundred and forty million pounds of extra money we should be getting every year. So I think we do an incredible job with what we've got. That said, we've got six million pound of overspend on adult social care, two point six million pound overspend on children. So it is. I think it's incredible we've managed to find the five million pounds in place in central budgets. Um, but that three point two million pound of earmark reserves, I think, is is the headline right and, and we knew it was coming throughout the year so my big question is how do we avoid this in the year to come are we confident we're not going to be in the same position when we get to the end of the year i know that we haven't budgeted to use reserves but what's the feeling at this point in the hour it's still quite early but are we able to to, to shave what we need to shave this year um well i'm i'm, I'm not going to make a prediction <laughs> um but uh the indications from the the reporting that we're doing so far so we're bringing a um uh, an update to executive in September but the indication so far it, it is improved from the previous financial year 
the council did put significant growth into the budget. A number escaped off the top of my head, actually, but it was a lot. So uh, we would expect to see an improvement. Well, we are still forecasting an overspend. Um, and I think that will be that will continue um, because there are all, there are always going to be pressures um, and areas of overspend. But we have started our budget planning. Um, we will be bringing a budget strategy update to Executive November in September um, as well. So we are starting on that process early again. Uh, we will be looking at where we can make savings. Um, where do we need growth? Um, obviously, we've got a new government and. Um, I've sent a lot of a lot of letters this week, haven't they? The new government. I think we have the parliamentary recess today or tomorrow, but we've had a lot of letters this week. Um, so, you know, we might get some more funding. Um, we, but we're not assuming that at this stage. So, I think we're doing everything that we can. But I certainly um, can't, you know, say that it's all under con. It's all going to be okay, and we're not going to need to do it again. I would hope that with the continuation of the cost control measures, the additional growth that we've put in the budget, the ongoing budget monitoring that we do across the council, that we would be able to manage within the approved budget. But we've got £14 million worth of savings to deliver in this financial year. That's what we approved in the budget. So that's an enormous challenge, as well as managing those underlying cost pressures. Um, so we're keeping a close eye on it. We're keeping a close eye on the amount of reserves. We will again be doing our regular refresh of what's needed uh, what's available um, because that changes. So we might set something aside in the amount reserved for a particular purpose. Uh, circumstances change and, and we're keeping a very close eye on that. Sorry, that's probably not a very satisfactory answer, is it? So... I, I think it, it, it covers the details. We, we know that there are unexpected costs each year. We know we built in some contingency, but you're saying it, it currently isn't enough and there's more to come, but we have the big budget consultation out at the moment that will bring in some things and we're working on what we can cut. Yeah. And we're in a better position than we were this time last year but there's still more to do and finances in the council are awful. That's, um, I think it understand, it answers my points. <laughs> in terms of some of the big sort of headline sort of savings that are in the last budget, obviously we've not heard a great deal about things like, you know, renegotiating the contract with Explore. Obviously the, the green waste tax last charge, that's coming sort of in halfway through the year. So that's a, a significant amount of money that's not sort of in. At what point do those sorts of things get? Is that the September report to executive where we're sort of saying we've not quite managed to hit the, this target? Yeah. This is our overspend. We need to do more or, you know, we're doing okay. Is that? Yeah. The, the monitoring report that's going to executive in September will outline the variances from the budget, including any any savings that are not being achieved. Um, uh, I don't know whether we're going to that. I'll have to check how much detail we're going into, actually. But um we do we do keep an eye on savings. We do rag rate um savings proposals. So um we've got we've got information. So if it's not already in there, I'll I'll, I'll have a look and make sure it's clear which savings are at risk or which savings are, you know, uncertain. Okay. Any further questions or have to go back to Councillor Rose. We're still on the narrative report. I know uh, I've still got a number of points, but I was expecting other people to chip in before it just becomes the me show. Um Page 90, there's a reserve movements. Um, so just, to, I guess, the questions around that. What does the move away from general fund into earmark general fund mean tangibly? The general fund's now only 9.6, including 2.2 mil for schools. Is that at low level? Is that is, that, is there any reason to have any issues with that? Um, and then capital grants reduction of 16.5 mil. Is that that we've used grant money or is that that we've lost grant money, um, if that makes sense? Uh, taking the capital grants first, um, we would have received um, the 48 million or parts of that 48 million in prior years, and we've released that during the year to fund capital expenditure. So um, it may be that we've not had as much in during the year, or we've just used more or, um, to reduce the balance. Um, general fund balance, as you correctly state, um, the reduction is against the school's balance rather than the the um council's general fund balance if you if we see them as two items we still we still have that um at 7.4 million so we professionally debbie would determine that we have the general fund at the correct level yeah but i guess that's that school fund means that's half then in the last year from if it's gone down by 2.2 but the balance is 2.2 
is the, what 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 does that school balance do? Their balance is held by individual schools, um, and because they're maintained schools, they're part of the council in terms of um, uh, for accounting purposes. So um, when we're looking at balances, we aggregate up all the maintained schools' balances as well. Um, schools budgets are under pressure just like everybody else's. So it, you're absolutely right. It, it, it is a sign that schools are not holding as, as much in their reserve um, as they would have done previously because they are also dealing with spending challenges and other pressures. Um, but they're decisions of individual schools. There is work ongoing um, uh, uh, within the finance team and within uh, the education directorate where we are working with individual schools to make sure they've got a balanced budget and that they've got a plan to reduce any deficit um, and that they're, they've got adequate reserves. So that, that works ongoing with individual schools. But the, what it means is that of all of those schools that are they're in this part, their reserves have lost 50% yeah. in one year. Yeah, potentially, but, but remember that those reserves... Uh, would not necessarily just be a general reserve they might be timing issues so they might have got a grant in year one and they're spending it across years two three four and five for example so it's and they might reserves going down is, yeah yeah it's not it's not um it's not as straightforward as reserves going down equals bad reserves going up equals good it, it, there are lots of ins and outs and, and timing differences is is where we hold we hold balances in reserves to deal with timing differences okay. yeah. that's it craft thank you i'll take a bit of the weight off councillor rose there <laughs> uh, just a couple of points. Um, firstly, around business rates, obviously, it is the policy of the new government to look at reforming them. Um, and once the detail comes out about that, we will hopefully see what role we are going to be playing as a council in that. I just want to know sort of how mm, confident you feel about us being able to transition to potentially a new way of business rates working. Um, I'll leave it there for now. But I do have an additional question. Thank you. Um, well, uh... Yeah, I mean, business rates is an interesting one, isn't it? Because, I mean, successive governments have said that they would reform business rates. Um, we had a revaluation, was it last year or the year before, Helen? Um, we've been talking about a business rates reset for quite some time. Um, and remember that business rates is uh, the system in place. It is quite complicated, but it's a method of redistributing funding around the country. So the, this council doesn't get to keep all the business rates it collects half of it goes to central government for redistribution to other areas so in any uh, system that you're changing that redistribution mechanism there's going to be winners and losers generally um don't be pessimistic we tend to be a loser in any kind of government formula uh, yeah um we've all we've all seen it before haven't we um but we, there's not enough information yet for us for us to know so we'd 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 be very keen to see any government ideas we'd be keen to contribute i guess to any kind of review and provide data we do subscribe um to um uh i can't remember what they're called helen uh, like an expert kind of pixel. company yeah pixel pixel thank you um who, who provide support to us on on modeling so we we get support into sort of model business rates and other information so once the government announces any detail i, I think we'll be in a good place to model that and understand what the impact might be for you I'll just add to that that the um the modeling for the business rates reset reset rather that Debbie was talking about actually suggested that York would lose um money that it was holding from business rates, partly because it would be taking the growth um away from York and we've done quite well out of business rates growth. Um, but that was going to be put back through um general fund grants. So although it appeared that we were losing on the collection fund, we were gaining, yes. So it'd be interesting to see, I think, what the alternative uh, proposal does for us. Okay. Yes. And this sort of second one ar around debt as well, a bit more of a um, specific one, but and we might be one, like one day too early with the interest rate decision tomorrow. But if interest rates are lowered tomorrow or if the Bank of England makes an interest rate decision, typically how long does it take for that to filter down to uh, the PWLB uh, loans that we receive? I mean, it's it's when we undertake borrowing, we take it at an agreed rate, and that doesn't change. So we'd have to refinance. Um, the rates reduced. The, the borrowing rates rates reduced pretty quickly, actually, don't they, Helen? Within within days, from my recollection. So that, that they're very responsive. PGLB rates. If the interest rate is cut, we will see within a few days an, a reduction in the cost of borrowing. But obviously, it will impact the borrowing that we already have. It'll only be for any new borrowing. That's amazing. To carry on with saving us from um, 
technical questions. In Annex A, uh, just at the bottom, I think it's just a correction, it says um, North Yorkshire Police Authority, which obviously kind of ceased 10 years ago or something, and obviously the Crime Commissioner now obviously be the Mayor's Office. So if we could just update the terminology, explaining what money we keep and who it's going to. Okay. Uh, back to Councillor Rose. Um, page 99 mentions that there is one outstanding bit on the audit of last year's accounts. Um, it doesn't say anything about what that is. Are you able to just let us know what's outstanding still? It, it's, it's pensions. I don't know whether Mark can provide any more information about that. Yes, yeah, so for the 22, 23 accounts, the only element that we are waiting for is um, assurance from the pension fund auditors, which are North Yorkshire. Um, and once we have that, information uh we'll be able to complete the city of york audit for 22 23 so it hasn't changed since the last time we discussed it thanks and apologies for keep not looking at the people who wrote, actually wrote the report and starting around um page, page 93 mentions a bunch of major projects and given the news that's been in national and local press this week around government funding decisions and and so on i just wanted to check if we'd had anything communicated to us across the whole of Duncan Barracks and Lowfield Green and housing development stuff, you know, Haxby Station, Outer Ring Road, Dueling, York Station Gateway, York Central, um, uh, Castle Gateway, all, all the things that were mentioned in there. Do we know if all of the yeah. committed spend is committed or? Yeah, we we, 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 um, we only know what everybody else knows really at this stage. Um, we don't anticipate there to be any issues actually because um, things like Lowfield and, and others are already kind of funded and that funding's already been agreed. So we, we don't anticipate any issues. Um, Haxby Station is the one I know less about, actually, in terms of the funding of that, but that's still at quite an early stage, isn't it? So we'd, we, we'll keep an eye out, actually, on, on what's anything's happening, but we don't know yet. Um, yeah. Just um, oh, this is more of a note, I guess. Is page ninety one talks about seven hundred and twenty grand of lost income from voids. Um, so, if if we were about to recommend any action on that, is voids are coming to housing screen on the 9th of October. But I guess it'd be good to make sure that the report that goes there um, covers this aspect of of voids when it's when it's going there. Um, the the second half of the same thing is that it mentions one point one mil of, depre of depreciation. I was just wondering how much of that is due to not spending as much on repairs how much of that is natural depreciation or do we know what that 1.1 mil has come from um, it's a depreciation calculation is it so i'm looking at helen and matt see if anybody can help me out with the detail of depreciation um but i i don't, I don't have that information i'm afraid we'd, we'd have to go in i'll take that one away for you Councillor Rose. <laughs> and, and my last one from the um narrative bit um there's a bit on page 97 about the increased value of non-current assets um, of 42 mil, um, disposal of 40 mil, depreciation 36 mil. I was just trying to work out how much of this is inflation and improvement, how much of it is new assets. Um, you know, What's the reason that Allerton Waste has increased value of 6.6 .6 mil? I know it's because we revalued it, but what was the difference with that in the previous valuation, if there's any visibility of that? I'm not, I'm not going to attempt to explain the vagaries of property valuation. So again, unless Helen or Mark can help, we might have to come back to you. I think they've commissioned a new valuation this year. Um, North Yorkshire County Council has led on that. I'm right in thinking. Yeah. Um, I could bore you to death on the valuation of uh, Allerton Waste Recycling if you wanted to, but essentially it's done on a depreciated replacement cost. So what that infers is that the costs, if you were to rebuild that particular asset, have gone up since the last time it was valued. So it's perhaps less an indication that the site is better or inflation is growing on that side. It's more about the cost of building now might be a lot higher than the cost of building was Absolutely. a year ago. Okay. Yeah, that, that I can only surmise that at the moment, but that, Thank you. it's probably what it is. Okay, that's sufficient. Thanks, Chair. Um, you may be able to answer this, you may not. Um, the York Outer Ring Road duelling. Now, I understand the money from that didn't come directly from central government. It came from the West Yorkshire LEP, if I recall. Has that money actually been received and is it secure for the, I think it was 65 million that was actually due? The reason I ask this is because it poses a colossal risk to the um, future of York because we have a lot of housing developments around the Northern Ring Road and their viability may be seriously affected. We may not be able to reach our housing targets and that impacts on the implementation of the local plan. 
Yeah, I'm not. Yeah, you're right. The, the York Outer Ring Road funding is a combination of council funding, but the majority of it does come from uh, the West Yorkshire Combined Authority. I'm not aware of any risk to that funding, as far as I'm aware. That's that's kind of locked in. Obviously, rising costs potentially could be an issue that we would need to keep an eye on. Um, the longer you take to do something, the more expensive it gets. So, um, I, I don't have more of an update than than that. I'm afraid, but it, we did use recently do a gateway review on that on that project. So I'm aware that. Um, that the funding is still there. Um, yeah. I think it's £38 million pounds from West Yorkshire and £25 million from the Department of Transport and then a bit from the council. And then, so that all adds up to £65 million, but we now expect it will cost more than that to build. So there's a gap. I'm, I'm well aware there is a significant funding gap and the question of where that money will come from whether it's going to come from central government or the mayorality or whatever, I don't know. But I am concerned because it puts the, the future housing delivery programme around the north of York into severe danger. Okay. Any further questions? If not, if we see what's next. Any questions on the um, income expenditure reserve statements? Yeah, Councillor Rose. Hoping somebody else would jump in first. Um, yeah, I, I I guess I'm just trying to understand if I'm reading page 106 correctly. So this is net expenditure year versus year. So every single line item went down from last year's net expenditure, and the overall goes down from 223 to 181, uh, and the overall income goes up whilst the overall expenditure goes down. So it goes from a deficit of 46 mil to a surplus of 1.1 mil. Is, is, uh, is that right? Am I reading that correctly? Um, and can you explain what I'm looking at? I'm gonna have a few. Can you explain what this means from now on? But um... yeah, I don't know whether Helen can whether you pick this up in the training, Helen, or you can do this one. Yeah, it, it'll be a combination of factors which won't give you a quick answer, I'm afraid. Um, I'm just thinking of the best way to explain it. Yeah, <laughs> there's there's some obvious places where expenditure has increased. Um, you know, if you look at children's, actually, the expenditures. No, that's gone down now. Mark. Might be easier if I could, if I can bring it back with a bit of a narrative behind it. Um, one of the places you can see. Um, we have um, a lot less taxation and non-specific grant income. If you if you go down to what's note eleven, two hundred and seven million um, in twenty two twenty three, and one hundred ninety two million in twenty three twenty four. So that will be driving some of that um, adjustment. But there's there's lots of factors at play. So I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll try and come back with a bit of narrative behind it. I think that'd be better for you. Yeah, I, it's, I guess. We're aware of the challenges around providing services, et cetera, but for the expenditure to come down and the income to go up seems really good, especially if it's, you know, to the tune of 46, 47 million pounds. So um, I might well be that I massively misunderstood the entirety of this page, but that what sounds like a good news story. In, yeah, in, in a, because what you'll also have within each service cost line is a depreciation allocated. Um, if depreciation allocated... Um, in one year is less, more or less, that's going to impact on the cost of service line. Um, so it isn't just a case of has children spent um, 126 million versus 143 million, there'll be other accounting adjustments within that line. So like I was saying in the training, you won't actually compare the outturn report to what's in the CIES for children's services yeah. because of those um, Accounting adjustments we put in. Yeah, you have to look into the individual, yeah. individual yeah, detail. Come in there. So the the outturn report is the one to to look at to see what the variances were. So where we overspent, where we underspent, what those changes were. This is um an accounting treatment. As Hannah said, it includes all includes all sorts of uh, weird and wonderful accounting treatments like depreciation and those things that are allocated to individual service lines that they have no control over, no influence over, and it's just the way we have to show it accounting wise. Um, there are. There aren't, we don't have any concerns. It, it, it's just how it's displayed. But as Mazar's 
do the audit, they will identify if there are any concerns and they will bring those back to you uh, throughout the year, but it definitely is part of the external audit. So if there was any uh, issues or areas where, um, where Ms. Ars felt that there were concerns, then they would be identified and, and brought to your attention. Okay. Any further questions on moves in reserves? No? no. Balance sheet. Yep, Councillor Rose. I've lost my page, but bear with me one second while I just pull it back. Do some very quick digging. Uh, one hundred and ten. Um Yeah, just I guess confirming that um the cash equivalents have dropped 12 mil. And and if you look on you know, page 163 later on, note 21, all three different types of cash have, have dropped. So that's our cash position as things stand. That's because we've moved the cash into investments and yeah, everything else. I'll just not reiterate, concern, it's nothing right? to be concerned exactly. about. And we're under, as a committee, I wouldn't necessarily recommend that that you go through that level of detail because Ms. House will do that for you. Yeah. Um, that, that's what they will do for you and present it back to you. So, um, yeah, it, yeah. I guess I guess that, that's the challenge. Is that's the fundamental you know, meat of the of 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 the accounts is the cash position, the 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 defined benefit scheme, a pension scheme, seventy million pounds, and then all the various short term borrowing versus long term borrowing numbers. A whole bunch of notes of like, well, what does this specifically mean? But it's mm. it, you know, it, it's how it all ties in together. It's, and it's the account. It's, it's the way that the uh, the code of practice works. And again, Mark might have a, a view on how they uh, have to audit certain things. This is, this is not a user-friendly, easy-read, no. resident-facing document. This is a technical accounting statement that we have to provide. It's a backward-looking document. It doesn't necessarily add any value to how you run the organisation. But when Mazars do their work auditing it, they will pick up any areas of concern or issues that would then get raised um, through the audit report. So it... I, I, don't, I don't want to... Um, I, I, yeah, I totally uh, get your point. I guess yeah, the, it's difficult, the, so, A, yeah. that's a while away. Yeah. <laughs> B, the public wants us to make sure that we're asking the right questions around yeah, no, things. No, and, sorry, so yeah, if you've got... No, I'm not, I'm not no, suggesting yeah. to the contrary. I'm just... The yeah. challenge is if that's where most of the important questions are around the overall state of council yeah. finance and overall, once you account for... Yeah the various long-term borrowing, how much we're doing investments, what these percentage rates of return are and how much our yeah. cash is. The areas you know, of concern would stuff, be balance. reserves. Um, so if we were using an excessive amount of reserves to balance, um, if we were doing more borrowing than um, than we'd said we were going to do a mob, you know, we were, we were constantly increasing our financing requirement or breaching our upper limits or breaching our treasury strategy. So there's probably a few things that would identify. Cash is something probably that we'd be less concerned about because of how we manage treasury, our strategy, as you know, has been to run down our cash balances to avoid borrowing. And we, yeah. we've now started borrowing again. So we, and we started borrowing right at the tail end of the financial year. So it's, um, it's not necessarily rep representative because remember as well, it's a snapshot as at the 31st of March, uh, the picture could yeah, be completely course. different on the 1st of April, which again, is why it's probably less than helpful for you in, in identifying where there might be problems. Yeah, and, and the, um, the cash position will change over the course of a month exactly. by tens of millions yeah. pounds up and <laughs> yeah. down. So yeah. no, I, um, you know, yeah. there was nothing in there that read, read as a concern, but it's that bit of, you know, us switching long-term borrowing down by 30 mil and short-term borrowing up by 39 mil. That's obviously a decision. Is that something that we should be at this point in, in the draft accounts trying to ask early rather than only having the conversation in November once we've got all the reports together and it's quite tricky to know whether we should be asking it. No, no, ask ask, ask away. Um, I don't know whether, Mark, you've got any advice from, from other authorities in terms of um, other ways that audit committees can get this information or uh, to put you on the spot. Yeah. Giving the councillors the opportunity to have a look, list those questions and then put them in. Um, I have, but me or me to have a look at it. So maybe have we done the, if we learn our lesson, we do the training a bit earlier. It's an opportunity for you to formulate these questions, submit them to us, and then we can give you a better response at this committee in terms of answering some of those questions. If that, yeah. Um, the income and the expenditure type accounts, if you look at North 30 it probably makes it a bit clearer as opposed to the CIES. 
Okay. Any further questions on that section? We then come to a dozens and dozens of pages of notes. Um, so I'll invite any questions or issues um, anybody's got on any of those. If you are able to give us an idea of a page number, that would be appreciated. And I appreciate there's two different page numbers. But, um, Councillor Rose? I didn't put my hand up. How do you know? Um, yeah, I guess note eight, which is uh, page one four three. I think I do have page numbers on it all, so that's helpful. Um, scrolling myself to one four three, um, uh, which is all of the the earmark reserves um, area. Um, so the the earmark reserves on general fund and the HRA um, went up ten mil. Um, I was just trying to, I guess, get into the understanding of of um, that that earmarked versus unearmarked um, reserves position. Um, don't know if there's any detail behind that, I guess, but um, it feels positive <laughs> if, if if you've got more in the earmarked reserves, right? Yeah, we, again, we can we can do a, a more detailed response. The um, uh, the kind of the the ones with the movement really is around. Um, of business rates and DSG, I think, isn't it, Helen? A DSG is, is probably to do with the safety valve program and making those kind of savings ahead of or, or getting that grant in um, ahead of time from the safety valve program and their reserves. I think ref um, business rates reflects a timing issue again, does it? it yeah, I think as I was alluding to, we receive um, what's known as Section 31 grants from central government where we are providing reliefs to um, business rates payers. Um, and because they come into the general fund, I'm trying to get too technical, but they come into the general fund in year one, um, we re realise a, a deficit on the collection fund and then release those um, funds from the reserve in a later year. So actually what you're seeing is a movement in the grants we've received more than um, a true cashable reserve, so if you like. It's only going to be used for the collection fund. Timing yeah. And movement. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, on the same page, just um, miscellaneous is quite there's quite a lot in there. What's what's in there? Is there, is there any way I can find out, or or how many funds and things that it, is it made up of? The honest answer is lots and lots of of different reserves. So I could, we can provide a list because we've got that. Yes. Fantastic. Do you, you uh, that with the group. How how many do you do you know? Not off the top of my head. Not off the top of my head. All right, no worries. Thank you. Um. In terms of the reserve for years we pool, so I think it said 1.5 million over five years set aside in 2015. There's 200, sorry, 400, well, 377,000 left. So presumably it's lasted longer than they expect. But at the rate it's going, it's probably going to be another couple of years before that's gone. If more money got put into that, would where would that money come from? Is Does that come from a sort of borrowing... What does it... it it would have to come it would have to agree a um a growth in the budget from revenue to put into the reserve so contributions to the reserve come from revenue uh, okay. for these ones so that would potentially be quite a big sort of revenue hit yeah yeah it would be a hit on revenue so it would require growth in the annual budget to to increase to put in a budget for a contribution to the yearly pool reserve yeah Okay. Any further questions, Councillor Rose? Um, yeah, on numbers um, ten and eleven, so page one four four one four five. Um, on note ten on one four four, it, it's got the income and expenditure in relation to investment properties, which was fifteen mil now minus three mil. And then on the next page on eleven, um, it's got non dom rates and and capital. Uh, grant income, which have gone down 22 mil. So that, that everything else seems relatively similar to previous year. But I just wanted to call out those as big discrepancies. Is that random timing or is that because something major has changed? Or... Yeah, the um, for note 10, the income and expenditure on investment properties also includes the changes in fair value. So the sort of valuation um, adjustment that will be in there. And I imagine that's what's driving that um, without looking at the at the detail of it. Um, for note 11 on the non-domestic rates, 
um, a, a timing around receipt of grants. We we had much higher Section 31 grants, um, which were sort of a knock-on effect to COVID, and they, they've been coming down. So that's the amount we've needed um, to fund the general fund position this year. So well, that's why with the capital grants. Uh, I could I would have to double check, but I imagine that's um, just as simple that we have received less capital grants in year. In twenty three, twenty four. Um, note twenty seven on page one hundred and seventy two. Uh, which is cash flow statements. Um, the um, pension liability net charge to CIES um, changed from 38 mil to, to 14 mil on there. Again, same question, is that a discrepancy or is there a, a sizable change to that for other reasons? Is that timing or...? Anybody can explain the actuarial valuations of a, a pension fund? Um, uh, yeah, there were some changes on the on the actuary evaluation, but yeah, I was going to say I could, I could more explain the um, the change on the ba balance sheet, um, pensions asset and liability, but it doesn't fully tie up to the net charge of the CIS, so that'll be a contribution, a, a combination rather of current costs and future costs, um, and it may well come down to the uh, the actuarial adjustment, but I'd, I'd have to take um, a bit more. Um, of an explanation but it includes kind of projections of where we think the economy is going and stuff yeah. amongst many other things absolutely yeah note 36 which i don't have a page reference for um but i will find it shortly 177 thank you um just a, a a positive note that we've got you know we're looking into this in january and we're asking for the details and the breakdown of councillor costs and the expenses and everything else um this says that it was fifty thousand pound less that councillors spent across the board and um you know including exec and everything else so just wanted to call that out as something that's of note um not a question on it um you know, there are various reasons for it but um um considering that was something we were concerned about at the start of the year that's it's good to see um, and then note 37 um, on, on the next page, um, there's a reference to the new chief officer structure on page 99 in the in the kind of highlights bit. And then in here, there's a lot of detail, but the, the, I guess the short version is that it's 17% more for the senior officers in 23-24 than there was in 22-23. But there's also that note around the new chief officer structure. I guess most of that is this financial year, not the previous financial year. So most of that's not reflecting here. So we are anticipating that that 70% increase is then followed by a reduction next year. Or do we know what that is likely to look like going forward at the moment? Um, I don't want to ask too many questions that we can't ask, but um, yeah. That, that's a reflection of where it was last year. Not, not yeah, where that, that was, um, yeah, yes, absolutely. It was um, um, what it was at the at the 31st of March, the remuneration paid in, in 23-24. There are, as you say, a lot of notes, there are a lot of changes. Um, uh, there were, yeah, that was reflected. It reflects the SME reports that were agreed in terms of the chief officer structure. Um I don't know what else I can say, really. Yeah, I guess we're not in a position yet to know, to anticipate what that's going to look like for this current financial year, no, based on all well, the changes that are happening. I mean, if everybody could just stay where they are until the 31st of March 2025, then that would be ideal. Um, okay. But yeah. The other thing that's driving the increase in 2324 will be the pay award, which was 2.5%, I think, chief officers. So you, naturally, there would be that increase again for twenty four, twenty five, but with it on a different um, structure. Yeah, I guess, I guess that's the point: is that a two point five percent increase would be expected. Seventeen percent is a proper hike. Um, obviously, that's then we're, we're, you know, there's, there's been action off the back of that, but um, it, it's yeah, again, one of those things where it's not it's not a small discrepancy year on year where it's just slightly up, slightly down. That felt sizable, but I guess it's kind of meaningless at this point because it's you know the actions already change the outcome of that. On, on the section, in terms of the officer remuneration, the listing of the number of posts that are greater than 50,000 uh, by uh, bands, 
Um, I know that's a I know that's a statutory requirement, but is the authority allowed to put in a parallel table showing the <laughs> if if you take the inflation into account, so you can actually understand what is simply driven uh, by you know annual increases in salary as opposed to what is driven by in effect council decision making. Uh, in terms of number of officers, gradings, those types of things. If I understand you're right, because potentially some people through inflation repay award might start to appear in this table, um, whereas in the prior year they wouldn't because uh, they were at a, a lower inflationary mm -hmm. rate. I don't, don't see why we couldn't. We could, we could look to include an yeah. explanatory note underneath the table explaining that um, the, the reason for the increase in numbers is due to the whatever the pay award was. I think that would be a problem. I think my point was slightly differently. It, if, if, you want, if we want to be able to hold things to account and the public wants to hold things to account, understanding what element of those number increases is simply salary, you know, ordinary salary increases versus specific decisions yeah, no, that's what I meant. We could, we could include that at the bottom yeah, to say yeah. how many of these posts have gone into that band just right. by virtue of having a pay award. Right. Okay. Yeah, I think that we'll, we'll have a go anyway. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, back to Councillor Rhodes. Done. Okay. There's no further questions or issues on Councillor Merrick. Yes. Uh, on page 183. Um, the uh, details of the deployment of the DSG. Um, this again may simply be the uh, the day on which this is uh, compiled. But uh, l last year there was very little uh, carried forward uh, to the current year from the individual schools budget, which is obviously you know means that the schools have had all the money. <laughs> Uh, whereas this year, there's 6.6 .6 million, uh, in effect, carried forward, which is money the schools won't have had at that point, uh, uh, which obviously, uh, you know, on the surface of it looks quite concerning, but is, is this simply uh, the, the, where the dates fall? I think that's timing, but we'll go in and check. Um, I'll go in and double-check that. Yeah. Okay. Does raise the question of what use it is looking at the. <laughs> it's understandable to uh, accountants and the other ninety nine point five percent of the population <laughs> struggles to uh, uh, get any. It's not understandable to a lot of accountants either. So um, yeah, only public sector accountants. Um, if you come from the private sector and try and um, look at these, a lot of private sector accountants get lost as well. So. Okay. If there's no further questions, then obviously thank you very much for your, for your work on this. It's a, a huge um, undertaking. Um, but I think we're just noting, and then this is coming back um, at some point later in the year. Move on then to item eight, which is the response to the LGA assurance report. And we've been joined by Claire Fole, who's the Assistant Director for Policy and Strategy. Thank you, Chair. Um, right, so in January 23, the LGA published an assurance report, which was in response to the public interest report. They recommended 10 recommendations for the council to consider. And Audit and Governance asked us to bring back a report against progress against those recommendations, which I'm here today to present. Um, I brought to you today Annex A, which uh, sets out our response to uh, with a report setting out how three key arrangements uh, were developed, including incorporating feedback from the Local Government Association Peer Challenge in February, with paragraph 11 of the report presenting the recommendation related directly to members from the LGA in the Peer Challenge. The three key arrangements um, have been designed to support members and officers 
and are in response uh, partially to the LGA um, assurance report. They are the member, uh, member information, which includes the welcome pack and portal on the intranet, the corporate improvement action plan, which was approved at the executive member decision session earlier this month and followed um, considerable scrutiny recommendations for which I thank them. Um, and then the final um, arrangement that we've put in place is the member induction program. A uh, progress report was presented to the Joint Standards Committee in May, and it's currently being audited by Verito. Um, just for information, and because this was brought up in scrutiny around the Corporate Improvement Action Plan, Annex A has been colour coded. Um, for those who were in the scrutiny, you can see it's the same colour coding arrangements with green complete and yellow underway and noting that red or very dark grey uh, relates to those um, aspects at risk with none of the recommendations at risk at the moment and all being completed or underway. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll just ask if the committee have any um, questions or issues to raise. Um, Professor Whitcroft. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, just in relation to the member induction programme, uh, it's good to see that that is going away uh, to be audited uh, by Veritao, and uh, I look forward to seeing that being brought back. Were there any sort of initial findings of the member induction programme, um, in particular with the consultation that was had with Joint Standards Committee, but also, as I brought up at the last meeting, we now have a new councillor who will be going through the member induction programme. I wonder if there's any special effort to engage him on this as well. Yeah, thank you. So the new member has been invited to take part in the member induction programme. And one of the one of their feedback or the feedback that's been um, in discussion with them is actually, um, if you like, a, um, a speedier version. So those key things that they need to know straight away would have been helpful. Um, in terms of feedback from the Joint Standards Committee, a lot of it was around um, access to the actual engagement program, in induction program. So the, um, for those of you that have um, taken part in the induction program, you know there are some information on ModGov and some information on Milo, um, and the videos are stored on Milo with the paperwork was stored on ModGov, and we're trying to look at bringing all that together to make it easier to find things when people need it. Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Rose? Yeah, so uh, I guess there's a related point specifically around the induction and um, um, I did ask John for his his thoughts on things and he had lots of positives and a, a few concerns. Um, but the, the big one for me when looking at it is on page 276, the, the, the specific bit that it says here is where to go for information. It says a lot of other things that's definitely included in the packs, it's definitely included in the training, it's really, really good. I think we, when we came in as new councillors, weren't particularly certain about where to go for information. There's nothing in the packs that's written to say where to go. A lot of it's kind of implied through the way that we do induction sessions. And on those particular sessions about particular topics, we can ask questions or there's a little bit of feedback given there. Um, but then a lot of that where to go for information was at the time to a sort of members' inquiry system that doesn't exist. And I think it's still not clear for me a lot of the time where to go for information or where to go for raising concerns or, or getting resident support. So I just wanted to highlight that I, I checked in with John to make sure that he didn't think, yeah, yeah, that's definitely been crystal clear this year. Um, um, but I think that is an area where perhaps I don't think that the welcome pack actually itself contains anything about where to go for information, but also in general, um, it could be improved. I certainly echo the points that you've said there about we did a lot in a short space of time and therefore it's quite hard to remember everything you did at the time but some of that probably wasn't day one stuff it could have been done a few weeks later and it'd be good to see um whether it's from 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 the audit of that or in general and recommendations for the future how we can space that out a bit better and hopefully we're learning for for, for john coming in um got some other points as well but... Is there anything you want to... um, I'll take away the where to go for information and we can add that to the member portal so actually it's a, a static piece of information that you can come back to whenever you need it yeah, and I think I think something that helps with the issues around the loss of member inquiries because that was very much a kind of one stop sort of shop, and you could send it there, and you knew that it would get dealt with. Um, now it's very much a sort of yeah, our WhatsApp is full of people going, I don't know who to speak to about this. What do I do? Um, so some sort of useful list, I think, um, 
if that doesn't already exist. Yeah, I think the, the, the training is really good, like the Milo, which I, I Google was when you said you didn't know what it applied for. I didn't know what it was either. It's my learning organizer, apparently. Um, but Milo is really good for a central place to go and revisit what you've done before. So if I need to look up a training and go, what was said, it's great. But I think I'm Googling stuff to say, Google report broken glass and then click on the link and go, oh, right, that's where I'm going a lot of the time. So, which isn't necessarily bad because it helps us to develop how, you know, residents um, feed stuff back, but. Well, I'll just start to send this stuff to YCC at, and that seems to do it. So there you go. Um, Councillor Mason. Uh, I suppose my only observations really was that this was the third time round in terms of the election. Uh, I think Democratic Services obviously did have a lot more staffing and probably could take a lot more kind of pastoral care and that kind of, you know, when people were new to the council, even things like, you know, just, I don't know, showing the way you get a notepad on a pen or something like that. And I think that's probably gone with the, or not really gone, but not as, um, not as easy to access with people working from home and things like that. So I think new councillors coming to this building particularly, I think it is having that kind of front door where they know they can find someone that's friendly that can help them. And um, that's not always a political assistant, maybe if they're not available. So I think just, yeah, that physical presence of, you know, within this building, where can they go for support? I think it's really important. And I think I'd say the same thing with uh, that thing about queries of, I suppose, why member inquiries was an important service that it's that same thing. If, you know, it, it took me nearly 10 years just to understand some things, and I still don't understand everything. So I think, again, having that central point you can send something to, um, I think is a really uh, a key one for them to take away. Uh, and I think, again, it, it also it stops the the officers that are good, that people kind of latch onto because they know they're good and they'll know they'll do with something, getting bombarded with everybody's uh, questions and hopefully shares the workload out. So, yeah, I think that front door system for physical support to go to see someone and also that kind of, you know, general guiding you to where the right person is is important. Um, Councillor Merritt and then Councillor Bishop. Can I echo uh, the Chair's comment about the uh, who, who to uh, talk to? When, when we had the introductory sessions last year, um, we, there was a request for a copy of the organogram of, uh, of you know, the more, the more, you know, not just senior management, but middle management as well. Um, we were told that we would be given that. It's never arrived. Um, another comment I'd make about the programme is one or two sessions were postponed and have never happened. Can I say that again? I missed that. Uh, one or two of the uh, proposed training sessions were postponed and yeah. have never actually happened. Yeah. Uh, some extra ones were scheduled and then got postponed and haven't happened. So the initial uh, you know, imp, uh, momentum has rather sort of dispersed and that needs addressing. We, I think uh, my, we, we were asked to give feedback on individual sessions, which I, I certainly did. What we haven't been asked is to actually give a, a feedback on the overall programme uh, and whether we feel on reflection there are some gaps in it that ought to be addressed. So, uh, uh, you know, circular to members on, on, on those lines, I think would be actually quite helpful and give you uh, useful information in terms of continuing programme of development. Um, I've got something on one of the other bullet points, but I'll, I'll leave off while, in case there's other people who want to speak on that set of issues. That's sufficient. Thank you, Chair. Um, with regards to the first point, members must be consistently act in line with the Members' Code of Conduct. I think we've done a lot of very, very positive things to make members aware of their duties, how things work. But the biggest problem is, and I speak as a veteran of the Joint Standards Committee hearings, when it comes to a member who doesn't obey the Code of Conduct, the sanctions available are pitiful to address the concerns. And some of some councillors just pay no attention whatsoever to the sanctions they're given. And I think we do need to somehow feed back to the LGA to put pressure on the government to actually introduce proper sanctions that will address back conduct when members do it. And until we do that, we're really tied on the key issue there, which is getting members to obey the Code of Conduct. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink unless you've got actually something to push the head under the wall. Yeah, completely agree uh, there, Councillor Fisher. I've substituted on joint standards a few times, and I'm aware. And it's not that this is impossible, because the 
there, until recently, if a councillor was absent for three council meetings without a decent excuse, they, well, without any excuse or even a good excuse, they had to uh, resign. So there are ways of making councillors sort of be disciplined if they don't meet the rules. Uh, I'm glad that that's not the case, uh, thanks to the uh, paternity maternity policy that we just passed. Um, but yeah, I, I would echo those those thoughts there. I'm not going to give my views on standards. <laughs> Councillor <Yeah. Rice. laughs> Um, I guess the only other thing on the induction stuff is that take-up was varied. Um, um, some of us are goody two-shoes and some people perhaps didn't attend everything. And whether that's good or bad and whether it matters, you know, it, it ties again into the Code of Conduct thing of like, there's no consequence you can give to people for not going to the training. But um, was there is there any other reason for that people didn't attend if they were attended a few and then felt, ah, I can probably pick this up without doing the training or um, have we learned anything from it? So I, I definitely worth taking that away. Um, there's, there's also some stuff about the references to corporate peer challenge and stuff in here that it's not tangibly part of this, but it sort of is an overflow of this. So we've got our assurance recommendations, but the kind of recommendations include all the recommendations of, of, um, uh, the uh, LGA peer review and I guess we as a and G haven't seen that but it has gone to other committees so um, whether we want to at some point try and bring those actions back around and do that review tail end of the calendar year or not I think that's that's an, up to the committee um, the, the big thing on here that's that screamed out at me is is the, the bits in the underway in the middle combination and the three the three that are, are in orange there are um, cross-party working trust between members and officers um, and members need to be consistently given um, the advice they need um, and there's there's um, I, I think it's, it's an ongoing challenge I think we've got some actions here that talk about what we're doing and we're talking about scrutiny chairs encouraging cross-party working but I think there is still an ongoing issue of that um, and there's a bit that says um, it's marked as done uh, in, in green um, instances of feeding information to people outside the council and encouraging them to stir urgently needs to stop um, without flagging anything in particular from the last week. Um, um, the, the, the concern around people raising things that aren't really issues as issues outside of council and not working collaboratively cross party, but driving you know, anti-party, inter-party issues is clearly something that we're not doing very well. And obviously we've got next week, I think it is, the the, the report back from Bryn around um, what was raised by the independent members. But I think saying that the assurance recommendations are being complete by the actions here and marking some as complete already, I think it's an ongoing concern. I don't think we've got better at it. Uh, we may have put some actions in place, but I'd, I think, you know, we'll, we'll deal with it next week perhaps. But I just wanted to flag that, when I'm looking at the LGA assurance and what we've done about it, I don't know if we have got better on those particular things, um, personally. Councillor Merritt. Well, that was nicely uh, from what uh, Jason was said. And I, I was looking at the uh, section on trust between and relationships between members and officers. Quite understandably, the big focus uh, and obviously reflects the original report is the um, exec member officer relationship. Uh, perhaps what hasn't had the same focus is the uh, non-exec member officer relationships. And you know, I'd, you know, just thinking of sort of performance review processes at work and 100 degree feedback and other type of techniques that are used to actually sort of look at relationships. One wonders whether there might be some role for, for doing that. Uh, in terms of you know getting members' views on how relationships with officers are working, but and and the other way around, uh, clearly uh, you know won't be able to do it too frequently because it would be quite a big exercise. But it might still be worth you know looking at periodically. Yeah. I think just to just a note, I guess. Uh, I'm just yeah. I'm noting down all your suggestions, and I'll feed them back to the. We'll have a discussion internally. Thank you. Any further issues? That's amazing. Uh, just on point eleven, I remember being at one meeting where it said that um, members of the public were going to be engaged with this review, but then obviously the um, this report says 130 uh, partners, residents, 
So I wondered which, which residents and how we selected them for that for this piece of work. For the member in sorry, for the local government association, Peer Challenge. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, so that followed the recommendation in this group, and we invited members of the talk about panel and the public participants on the day. So the public participant of the A and G panel who raised it. The talk about panel. Talk about panel. There's about twelve hundred residents that okay. um, regularly respond to consultations. It's not not a panel of kind of ten then or something. <laughs> no. Okay, there's no further questions at this point. Um, yeah, thank you for your report. Thank you. Move on then to item eight, which is, sorry, item nine, which is the uh, Audit Governance Committee. Go on then, we can have five minutes until quarter past. It's okay.
Right, I think we're all more or less back. Um, we can move on then to item nine, um, which is the Audit and Governance Committee Review of Effectiveness, which I believe is being led by uh, Max Thomas and Conor Munro from Derry's Howe. Uh, thank you, Chair. So this is um, a short report, hopefully fairly self-explanatory. Um, the committee's been asked to consider whether you want to undertake a review of your own uh, effectiveness. And if you do, when you might want to undertake that review and in what form that review should should take. And I've set out uh, some options, tried to summarise the sort of pros and cons of each option. So really it's over to the committee to, to consider uh, how you take it forward. Thank you. Um, so Councillor Mason and then Councillor Whitcroft. Uh, I suppose one question, and, and with no res disrespect, I just why this kind of came as a um, very terrible report as opposed to a kind of council officer report, given it's a kind of internal thing. Um, but um, my second observation or comment is, uh, yes, I think we should. I've been on and off this committee for a long time and I've never really done any benchmarking with what do the committees do? Is there anything we're missing? Anything we're doing too much of? Um, I think a hybrid approach, maybe asking someone from North Yorkshire to uh, work with us. So there's some form of externalness, but it's not but it's someone that understands the context, like Barry Carver, so I think would be a, maybe a useful way forward. But um, yeah, happy to hear the opinions, but that's mine. So are you able to answer why it's coming from Barry Tower? Uh, well, simply, um, we, we've done... We've supported council, other councils, do similar reviews, and we've also done reviews in this council, although some years ago. Okay. Um, Councillor Whitcroft. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, and thank you very much for this report. Just to sort of provide us, guess, the opposing view of, of Councillor Mason, which is that we have had the LGA peer review, which we've just spoken about which will have reviewed our governance process. We've also earlier on in this committee got the revamping of our own governance process. I think this committee does function, there can be a, a tendency for self-flagellation sometimes in this uh, council, but I, I think this committee functions very well, particularly when it comes to how we've dealt with the constitution, setting up a working group there. Um, as we discussed earlier, the lack of sort of teeth that any council committee really has um, other than, you know, the, the statutory duties makes, I, I think our effectiveness pretty strong. I'm also concerned about the cost implications and the time that it might take if we have to set up another working group or dedicate a whole time to this. I do appreciate the report, not not at all a, a criticism of investigating this, but I I would personally say I don't think a review of the effectiveness is, is an effective use of the committee's time. Okay, Professor Rose. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd counter that. There's, there's, there's no time scale in here that we have to do it this month or whatever. I think, you know, it's it's worth us at some point having the self-assessment of whether we can be better. And if we spend a bit of time talking about how we can improve our outcomes, then that's time well spent. Um, if it finds that we're actually as good as we can be, amazing. I'd love I'd love to find that out. I suspect there are ways we can improve. Um, but I, I would like Verite's input on what the cost might look like if we do that. If are there examples of, of what it might be elsewhere? Because I, I agree with the report that us not having that external perspective, knowing what other councils does limits our ability to self-assess. I certainly agree that I don't think that cost is necessarily well spent on this, but knowing what kind of ballpark that might be might help us, you know, even if it's just number of days of um of time from externals, um, I think it'd be helpful for us to have that in mind when we're looking at the three options and whether we want to do it at all. Um, well, I have to confess, I, I I can only speculate who might be able to do this work. So, SIP for my, you might be able to commission SIP to do a review like this. Um, and how much that might cost, I don't know, but we're probably talking um, some thousand pounds. You know, it's not going to be a cheap uh, piece of work. So, anything that um, you commission for me. Uh, an external expert is going to be it's going to be a budget implication. Okay, that's three people spoken and three diametrically opposed views. That's that's helpful. Um, I think for my part, I think we should certainly undertake a 
a self-assessment, at least um, at the outset, where we as a committee think about that um, ourselves and then whether or not we then sort of ask for any outside um, advice or help on aspects that we might think might be needed would be my sort of preference for how to to go about it. Um, that's the suggestion. We had a meeting with Bryn and um, Mr Lee, who's the obviously the independent member. Obviously, you'll be aware he had some concerns, which he shared via email, um, and he was content that his concerns could feed into that sort of process. Um, and that might be a way of um, helping address some of the issues that he'd raised, um, as well as also, um, you know, doing what we should be doing, which is the best practice from SIPFA, which is a periodic self-assessment, um, which I'm not sure when the last one by audit and governance was, but presumably it's been a while. Um, so that would be my preference. If it helps, the um, the, the self-assessment checklist in the guidance is actually quite short. Um, we could easily convert it into you know, like a electronic survey, circulate it to uh, members. I suspect it probably wouldn't take you long to complete it. So it's not going to be, a, if you want a light touch approach, that would not be such a burden, I don't think. I think that'd be a good place to start at least. And then you've got a, you've got the light touch approach. And if looking at that, you then decide that you need more, then you can do that afterwards, I guess, can't you? So maybe that's the best place to start. Councillor Fisher? Thank you, Chair. It's never a bad time, not bad just to review your effectiveness, to have a look at what you're doing, assess whether you're doing it. If you have benchmarks, that's the problem. You've got to have some benchmarks to compare yourself with. Now, I've served on an audit committee before, but that was 30 years ago on a different authority. And I have no idea what audit and governance um, committees on other authorities do. I've tried looking on North Yorkshire, but I don't think they webcast them. So consequently, I've not been able to find anything to look at the way they work. Um, we have got independent members who can provide some insight into what we're doing. Mr. Lee has already put some points. Um, I think uh, at the moment, I don't think it's worth spending money on. I think at the moment we should do it as a self um, self assessment. Look through where have we been criticised, where are we, you know, where have we been praised, where do we feel we've been most effective, where do we feel we're falling down. I think we can do that within the remit of this. Can with the, the sort of it, uh, I can't find the right word. My brain's just gone fuddle. Um, within the area of this committee, within the expertise we have within us, um, I, I think we should do it. And I think an internal review is the way forward. Okay. That's a rose. Yeah, I mean, I think I think if we're talking, you know, maximum a few thousand pounds, it isn't the end of the earth in the sense that we're we're a budget of tens of millions, hundreds of millions. Governance inefficiencies inevitably will be costing us hundreds of thousands of pounds a year as an organization. Whether we can fix them or not as a committee, different matter, but making ourselves more effective isn't necessarily a, a poor use of money. But but I do agree, I think at this point in time, the there isn't a justification for it. I think it was really good, actually, really heartening that reading through the the AGS and looking at all the kind of governance summaries, I knew what all of those were from ANG. We are looking at the big things that are coming through, um, which is very encouraging. Um, I think it would be good to have some external perspective on that. Um, and I um, certainly, I mean, agree more with Ashley. I guess on we we can bring in external councillors from from other councils into a working group if we have a working group set up. But in the first instance, a a self reflection survey online doesn't take us much time. Um, a working group could just be you know a couple of hours on a on a virtual call at some point in the future. Um, I think there is merit in doing it, and it doesn't have to cost us anything. And yeah, it, it can take a few months if it needs to. I'm hearing some broad agreement for this for at least starting with a light touch approach and then seeing where we end up after that perhaps if we um ask Bryn as part of his um next um governance report to bring forward a suggestion for how we might go through that sort of whole process on the basis of what we've talked about and we can um approve that um i think at the moment it's yeah, we, there's too many kind of unknowns for us to say definitively we'd like to do this, this and this. Um, hopefully, Bryn will be able to sort of set it out in his in his report and, and come back to us with a sort of suggestion based on what we've said um, and perhaps a survey leading up to that 
um, would be the best approach. Generally happy with that. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I I assume that also includes the independent members. Yeah, yeah. Do the review. Okay. okay. Thank you. Um, move on then to the work plan before going back to the um, annual report of internal audit. Um, are there any issues anybody would like to raise with the work plan? No. Um, the only thing I picked up through the meeting, and I probably lost a bit of paper that will remind me what it was, was the uh, the community governance review. Maybe that would be something it would be worth having a paper on when the um, new officers got their feet under the desk and that's started. Um, so maybe it might be worth just sort of putting it in for September or November and then just... You know, it can get rolled over. Okay, maybe November. Yeah. Okay. Maybe we could just sort of pop a reference in uh, for November, so we don't forget. Um, that'd be useful for us to have a look at that. That's the only thing I've got. So if there's nothing else. We move on then back to. Well, I'll just say here that there's no urgent business. So um, after item. Well, item 10 is split into both um, a public session, which will continue as normal, uh, and then a private session um, where we'll be looking at um, a series of papers produced by uh, internal audit. Um, so we'll close the meeting when we get to the uh, private session and we won't return, um, at least online. So for the mainly sort of for the remaining public session if we could keep our comments and questions on the on the white papers and then save any issues on the um, pink papers for the private session okay so I'll hand it back to thank you chair so <clears throat> this is uh, our annual report where we set out the uh, uh, internal audit and counterfeit work that we've uh, undertaken in 23 24 uh, the reports in two parts uh, annex one covers internal audit and Connor's going to talk talk through that uh, and then he'll pass back to me and I'll talk through Annex 2 which is the uh, counter forward work that we've done. So. Thanks Max. Uh, Connor Munro, Assistant Director, Audit Assurance. Um, so just to take you through um, Annex 1, as the report proper begins on page 297 of your PACS, uh, the public sector internal audit standards require us to deliver an opinion on the Council's framework of governance, risk management and control. The basis for that opinion uh, is on the body of work that we undertake during the year. Um, it also provides us with an opportunity to provide the committee with some reassurance uh, that it, uh, we continue to conform with professional standards. Um, that section itself is introduced on page 300 and then is detailed in, in Annex E. Uh, the outcome of our internal self-assessment suggests uh, continued conformance with uh, the uh, public sector internal audit standards, uh, something which the external uh, assessment also concluded when we presented this to committee back in November. Uh, but returning to the internal audit work itself, uh, since the last report to this committee, we've finalised nine internal audits. Uh, summaries of those are contained in Annex B, uh, so beginning page 306. Uh, members of the committee have also been provided with copies of the final reports, both when they were in issued initially uh, and then separately uh, as a part of the papers for this committee. Uh, a further seven audits remain in draft at this point in time. Uh, and if you were to look um, at our Appendix A, uh, you will see that there are also some audits still uh, in progress, which are effectively carrying over into uh, the current year. So. We've also continued to follow up agreed actions from previous audits, um, as, as you would expect, and generally good progress has been made uh, in implementing these over the course uh, of the year. So taken together, uh, and, and the most important part of this report from the committee's perspective uh, is, is our opinion. Uh, we've been able to arrive at a reasonable assurance opinion, and that's detailed in page uh, paragraph 17, 
Um, and we haven't suggested any inclusions uh, in the annual governance statement, which obviously the committee considered earlier in this in this meeting. Happy to take any questions um, this stage um, or otherwise um, to pass to Max to, to address the counter fraud part of the report. Can, can I ask about the uh, foster care uh, arrangements? When when was that last previously audited in detail? Within se several years ago, it isn't showing on our audit management software. So uh, at least five years ago. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Mason. Uh, thanks. Uh, two things, I'll say them both. Um, obviously, there's a fair few in draft and a fair few in progress. Um, I just want to check your kind of content with that and feel that you'll be able to kind of manage getting all of those uh, done. Uh, and then uh, just under that, where it goes on to kind of other work that you've completed in 23, 24, uh, it says about the little rough sleeping accommodation program. I just wondered what your um, involvement was in that process or in that service. Sure, thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so to return to your point around the draft reports and then the in-progress work, yes, the draft reports we would be expecting to, to bring to conclusion over the coming weeks. Um, whether or not we've between now and actually the time for the next committee and, and the leading times that will be available in final or not, um, it might be sort of touch and go, but um, there's certainly not going to be a big imposition on the current year's programme of work. Uh, obviously, we provide a continuous service. It's a bit of an artificial over overlay, the fact that we have financial years attached to that so that the fact that there's in progress work um, isn't a concern for us and in fact um, it's supported by a number of other in progress audits which relate to the program that the committee recently approved so no no issues from from that point of view in terms of the rough sleeping accommodation program uh, that was just one of several um, grants that we were asked to certify so to give assurance to the awarding uh, department um, the arrangements were satisfactory. Um, so that would have been a short piece of work to, to confirm that enabled the council to, to give that assurance back. Is that a standard thing that we do with all kind of external contracts or is that something we pick up on a ad hoc basis? Yeah, so it tends to be that we have several um, types of certification work. So scam busters is one, uh, often the transport grants, supporting families where there's actually a requirement for us set out as part of the Annex G or whatever equivalent there is where there needs to be some internal audit involvement in that. So we know quite often in advance we're going to need to spend some time. Uh, and then depending on what uh, funding the council has been awarded, then sometimes it's ad hoc as well, we'll be invited to, to complete the certification process. So, so in, in short, some of it can be, uh, I guess, known in advance and others uh, depends on uh, funding awarded. Uh, and just to confirm, so that is the that that is work that you've done in the twenty three twenty four year, opposed to work now looking back at that year. Yeah, that's okay. right. Super, thank you, Councillor Burton. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I just had a quick question on the whistle blowing section. How do those bits? How do you? Uh, how are they brought to your attention? I mean, I've so previously used to work in the council. I'd say more than the numbers of things there. I guess people who've worked in the council have raised concerns beyond that number. How does it officially reach that figure? How does that become a figure in terms of what if what counts as a whistle blowing activity? Um, so uh, we we do a lot of awareness raising to encourage uh, uh, employees to uh, raise concerns. Um, the the policy um, uh, uh, encourages employees to to initially report any concerns to the line manager or, or part of the management uh, chain. Um, however, in some cases, employees aren't happy that uh, or don't feel comfortable reporting concerns that way, or they report them and they're not satisfied with with the outcome. And in that in that situation, uh, they can contact us directly, and they can do that in a variety of ways. You know, by email, phone. They can arrange to come and see us, and uh, they will raise those concerns. And then, if we if we believe that they satisfy the uh, requirements of the policy, then we'll treat it as a whistleblowing concern. Thanks. Having said that, quite often people. 
poets will be raising concerns which we regard more as grievance matters of, of a grievance nature and therefore don't fall within the, the, the supplying policy. But where, where it's a, a genuine concern, we'll then investigate. Okay, Councillor Merritt. Um, in terms of the areas that you deal with, there's three uh, where no opinion is offered to, to uh, relate to health, and there's one that deals uh, re relates to um, make it York. Um, I just uh, I just want to understand why no opinion is is offered. I'm sure there's probably a very good reason. But I just wanted to understand the logic of it first. Yeah, sure, absolutely. So. Uh, there are certain instances where the scope or the nature of the work that we've performed or the nature of the area that we're reviewing, we can't apply necessarily the full suite of um, testing procedures that we would undertake to give a, a, an assurance to that. Mm -hmm. In the case of um, the, the work that we did with Make It York, um, we actually learned from experience elsewhere that because we're using sit for best practice guidance on that to then arrive at an assurance rating based on that rather than a you know prescribed framework for governance beyond what's set set out um, externally is a little bit unfair i think and actually dilutes what we're trying to do it's more about encouraging um, good practice so in that instance we, we gave no opinion um for the data security and protection toolkit review um similar in the sense of the work that was undertaken to give some reassurance to the council that the officer submitting that had sufficient evidence to support that the assertions they were making. We didn't apply a full suite of testing procedures. We just tried to vouch for what was said. So in that case, it felt more appropriate just to give feedback than to say, here's our opinion on that system, because a system in itself isn't, isn't actually a tangible thing. It's made up of lots of different aspects across the council. If I could ask a supplementary, are those areas effectively covered by the first two by the NHS own auditors, mm -hmm. or so? Uh, but what what's the situation in terms of making York, given they're in effect administering council assets and so on? Yeah, so they could have their own regime for internal audit. We don't necessarily have though through the, through our charter. We would possibly have the ability to interact with them in more of a way, you know, potentially from an audit perspective, but um, they would presumably have their own, if they wanted to, their own assurance arrangements. I, I doubt they do, given their their size. Um, but for NHS side of, side of things, um, yes, the NHS actually inspect and review returns that are made by local authorities. If they're not satisfied that arrangements are strong enough to allow that authority to process the data, then they can prevent that. So as well as us giving our view, yes, the NHS will have their own um, inspection internally. Okay. That's right. Um, I think it's it's a really helpful report and, and thank thank you very much for for, for the detail. And um, there's uh, a lot of, of really good detail. I actually think Appendix A on its own, just going through all those areas and seeing substantial reasonable, it shows the level of diligence that we go to as a council, how much um, you you, you uh, share that opinion and how much you don't. Um, and obviously we've seen a lot of these reports already prior to this. The the one that sticks out, obviously, it already been referenced is the foster care payments, the only one that um, is limited assurance. Um, I, I was struggling to work out which ones were restricted and which ones weren't restricted papers. And once I figured it out, I realized I can't ask much on it, but it is on, uh, it's referenced on page 311 to 312 in the not restricted section. Um, and so while, we, while we're able to ask the question on that bit, the main question for me is, obviously the, the detail in there is quite, I don't want to say frightening because it's, it's, a lot of it is governance, doesn't necessarily mean there's a bad job being done, um, but direct, you know, multiple policy documents that directly conflict um, grievously with one another. Um, there aren't procedures documented for how to do major things. A whole bunch of stuff in there is quite quite problematic. There were a whole bunch of actions agreed off that. I just want to see what your level of confidence is in those actions um, being completed. To what extent that will you know eliminate the challenges. I know we'll get into that in more detail when we're not in public view. But I think it's a good question to to ask you while we're here. 
Thank you. Yeah, I think the answer that I, that I can give is that none or very little of this was actually a surprise to the service. Now, you might then say, um, well, hasn't anything necessarily been done at this this just juncture? Um, well, there was a, a, a directorate-wide service review on the way at the time we did this work. So um, I'm very confident that these actions will be taken. Um, you know, obviously, um, it does depend on, on management taking that action, but it feels to me that this is part one strand of uh, a wider sort of improvement um, strategy that we've been made aware of. Um, so if it's taken in that spirit, then these should be uh, addressed in full. We obviously agree actions rather than making recommendations. So we try to get that buy-in at the outset uh, and al also try and set in, in, in reasonable timescales. But like all other actions, we will be following those up as well to ensure that they are, are completed. Thank you. That's useful. And I guess if you're saying that the, these were you know, known as an area of concern in advance, you've obviously got a lot of stuff that's draft or in progress. Is there anything in there that at this point in time you're happy to say are potential areas of concern or anything that um, you know was 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 flagged specifically for you to look at because it was known to be an area of weakness for the council? There were no areas that were specifically sort of targeted for areas of known weakness. Though likely the, the topics here, um, obviously we're going back a while for their initial inclusion are either because of their importance to giving an opinion at the end of the year. Um, we can still place reliance on that work being at draft stage. It is substantially completed. We know what opinion we were going to reach. Uh, we just haven't publicised that. Um, you know, um, but actually, I would say of those that are on that list, um, there are a couple that I know to be on the lower side of the um, assurance rating scale, um, but mainly are coming in at, at reasonable um, or, or substantial the ones where they are um, are, are more narrow, limited areas where the overall concern council wide is less is less of an issue. So um, we still give that reasonable assurance opinion on the basis of this work. So it won't change our opinion uh, come the end of the year. Yeah. Okay, can I just ask about the uh, risk um, the risk based approach? Uh, to audit, so you, you know, you you understand why certain areas where there's big money or or mm -hmm. big opportunity are are a, a you know an obvious focus, but the the flip side of that coin is there will be a lot of areas which um, are perceived low risk, but they probably be, you then had a situation where they're never looked at, mm -hmm. um, and that is surely a risk in its in itself so i just wondered how you sort of handle that latter issue yeah sure so as part of developing our work program we have what's known as the entity or audit universe and what that means is in, in i guess in uh, simpler language is areas all areas of the council that are possible to be audited so we have a list of everything that can be audited so as a starting point um we would look through that list um, and we would sort of evaluate what have we done recently, what assurance opinions have we reached for work in that area. Um, you know, if if no recent coverage, then the next step is consultation with, with officers. And we could say we haven't looked at that for, for quite some time. Do you have any views on how well um, that, that area is, is operating? You know, we might even decide ourselves if we haven't looked at it for a while, um, regardless of, of consultation. Actually, we feel we want to, to look at it. So. Nothing is, is disregarded because the start of the process begins with looking at, at everything. Yeah. Okay. So no further question then. Shall we move on to the counter floor then that we pull and then come back to the um, pink papers? Okay, so um details of the counter floor work uh, that we completed in the year uh, are set out in uh, annex two. Um I think overall it's been a a, a good year. Um, we delivered uh, quarter savings of two hundred and eight thousand compared to the target of two hundred thousand. Uh, we completed one hundred and nineteen cases, and of those, uh, fifty five percent were what we uh, class as uh, successful outcomes. Uh, three people were prosecuted, uh, and we issued cautions and warnings to a further. 28 people during the year. Um, as we've already mentioned, we, we had one whistleblowing complaint 
raised with us uh, during the year. That, that case is uh, currently uh, under investigation. Um, so in the report, also summarise some of the other activities that we've completed. So done quite a bit of work uh, raising awareness of the sort of fraud risks with council staff, uh, training uh, uh, key staff groups uh, to be alert to uh, some of the uh, potential areas of fraud and just generally uh, keeping it very much in the forefront of uh, people's minds. Um, Clearly, we also do quite a lot of work to try and publicise uh, reporting. So we do encourage members of the public, uh, contractors, employees and uh, elected members to uh, report suspicions. We'd rather um, have lots of uh, issues reported to us and find that most of them uh, don't want investigation rather than not hearing anything. So uh, we, we are keen to uh, publicise uh, the arrangements to report forward. Um, we also obviously we've received details or referrals from uh, other local authorities, uh, other public uh, bodies, um, and we also, uh, well, the council participates in the National Fraud Initiative, which generates a large volume of uh, potential data matches, which they also need uh, investigating. So um, overall, a lot of work done, and I think some uh, good outcomes. Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Whitcroft and then Councillor Merrick. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much for this report. I'm particularly pleased to see that the um, £200,000 of savings has come out of preventing uh, fraud work. Hope that that continues. Um, obviously, I don't hope the fraud continues, but I hope we're, we're continuing to be able to locate it. I was just interested, and I appreciate it, it is only 1%, but one, obviously that would still be £2,000. What COVID-19... Uh, how, how can someone claim fraud for COVID-19, given that the pandemic is, is very much over? Uh, so so these are uh, COVID-19 grants, which are still being investigated, still followed up. Um, uh, there are some cases, the legacy cases, sometimes it just takes time to uh, get get to the bottom of what's actually happened and whether that, that was actually fraudulent. So, so it's a legacy case, not someone who's applied for... OK, thank you very much. Councillor Merrick. Yeah, um, this, this is one I'm wearing my uh, ward, ward councillor hat um, uh, in terms of the uh, parking fraud uh, section. Um, the issue of holiday lets has uh, certainly been raised with me on a couple of occasions. So welcome uh, what, what you've done there. But one, one of the questions that I've been asked is, whilst you may have you appear to have prosecuted some of the blue badge offenders, um, none of the uh, holiday let offenders have been prosecuted. Uh, and I wonder, you know, what's, you know, do you make that decision or is that something that comes back to the council's legal services and what's the basis of your decision making yeah. here? Uh, so there is a, there's a, a policy in place. Um, we will make judgments on each case. It will depend on uh, the, the circumstances of the point, you know, uh, the motivation of the, the individuals, the the sums involved, uh, whether it's actually uh, it's in the public interest to uh, pursue cases. Cases do do cost money. There's there's a lot of resource required to prosecute cases. So we generally uh, choose those cases which um, we feel uh, want prosecution. Uh, in a lot of cases, I think it's probably in the in the council's interest simply to either stop that activity taking place. Uh, or to recover uh, the fortune, uh, the funds that have been lost. Mm. Uh, in, in terms of, sorry, I should have added, we will make recommendations to the council. It's always the council's decision ultimately whether to prosecute them. Yeah. Okay. On a linked issue, um, the, the other thing that I regularly get asked about besides the uh, abuse of the parking is the abuse of the bin collections. So, uh, in effect, people having bin collections as residential property, when in effect it's a commercial uh, operation, is that also being in you know subject to investigation and being dealt with? I'm not aware of any cases being reported to us, but 
Um, if there are issues, then that's something we'd probably be interested in. <laughs> probably regret saying that. <laughs> that's Mason. I suppose linked to that again, you're saying about properties being used as holiday lets without um, whatever the right tickets or parking permits, whatever they come under. Is there any work then done with planning enforcement to share that intelligence that they can then take action against people that are using a residential home as a holiday let without permission? Yeah, our four team work very closely with, with parking, not only with uh, uh, residents' parking permits, but also in terms of blue badges as well. So there's, there's good communication between the two teams. I don't know if you heard about said I was about planning enforcement, sorry, about the use of holiday lets. If you've got a property where they're using tickets for parking and they shouldn't because it's a holiday let, does that information then get shared with planning enforcement? Um, I'll check that. I, I assume it does, but I'll double check that that. We're providing that information. Okay. There's nothing else then on these reports. If we close the public sector of the meeting now, that's okay. If we move into private session, we can discuss the uh, 